Well, the market certainly woke up from its snooze fest, and to quite literally nobody's surprise, made a new all-time high on Friday, even after a bad PMI print in the morning. And this makes our job fairly easy, but we can't get caught becoming complacent here, so let's take a look through the data points and build a logical game plan for the week ahead. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button, and subscribe. Let's see if we can get to 100k by May. And stay tuned until the end of today's show, I've got five additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So we'll kick things off today on the SPY monthly time frame chart now that the bar of February has officially closed out and there's not much to say here other than buyers are in control. Solid green bodied bar making a new higher low as well as a substantial higher high on the bar to bar count. Obviously we've broken out over the previous all time high from a monthly point of view any higher low retests over that make a lot of sense for a monthly higher low. We also know that this level is interesting as well much closer to 459 in terms of the extension pattern, we can clearly agree or we should be able to agree that this is totally a cup and handle breakout and 520 is the measured move target. If we take it even further out on the monthly time frame chart, just as a general reminder, right, if we come in from this low up to this high to this pullback low, October of 2022, this is a bull flag measured move from this perspective. We've only now just hit the 61.8. The full extension is a massive target much closer to 610. I'm not arguing that we go here this month next month or even this year, but that is the projected move out of the monthly bull flag. If we drop it on down to the weekly time frame chart, this is where I think things get a little bit more constructive in terms of actionable takeaways. Let's take a look at candle structure and location as we always do. Here it is, candle structure, solid green bodied bar, a little bit hammer-esque with a lower wick, just implying that the buyers stepped up near the lows of the weekly range. They were able to push prices back up to the opening print, so healthy pullback, right? And then through the opening print for range expansion into blue sky territories closing at the highs of the range as well as a new all-time high close. So buyers are in control structurally. If we think about location on the bar to bar count, we've got ourselves a higher low as well as a higher high. It's two for two bulls on parade of the last 18 weeks. Only two of them were able to close red. And of those two, one of them didn't even produce a bar to bar lower low. It was really just a weekly balance area. So we're in an uptrend. We're sitting on the higher high. There is no indication of a pullback, but if one were to develop, we know we can certainly afford a higher low without jeopardizing the weekly uptrend. And two levels really come to mind here. The first one would be the top of the two-week balance, turning prior resistance into newfound support. And that's almost what happened in the lower wick of last week's bar. But if we were to print a red weekly bar, something that looks like this certainly maintains the overall uptrend. The next level is the line in the sand that we've been talking about for a number of weeks now. And by the way, this is 503. We'll see that more closely on the daily in just a moment. But this level down here, the top of this multi-week balance, as well as if we just zoom out on this chart, confluence with the previous all-time high is still the weekly line in the sand. The level there is 480 down to 477, treat it as a three-point zone. So let's take a closer look through the lens of Fibonacci retracements first, and then we'll deal with the extension here. But if we come from the October pullback low to the new all-time high, if we could get a click, thank you, thinkorswim, there we go. The 38.2 is still underneath 480 and 477, validating the idea that this is technically healthy bull flag consolidation, there's nothing with a pullback that is as deep as 480 to retest that prior structure. Once again, 503 stands in the way, and this, of course, would be much more bullish, but there's nothing wrong with getting down towards that 480 zone. In terms of the secondary Fibonacci perspective, I would come in from this pullback low up to the most recent all-time high, and what I'm most interested in is the 50% retracement just because it represents the bottom of the two-week range right here. If we were to break down underneath that, that's where I think you can achieve about a 10-point pullback from from 490 to 480 down here. And of course, you're trading a daily downtrend along the way. It's very likely that if a weekly pullback were to develop, you're going to fall into a daily downtrend, right? So one step at a time, there are no indications of pullbacks, but the key levels to walk forward with are certainly 503, then we have this at 490, and then this is the major line in the sand at 477 down to 480. If we take a look through the lens of anchored view apps on the weekly, the anchored view app to the minor pullback low is confluence with 490.
90. So supporting the idea that if that breaks, it wouldn't be unreasonable to travel and rotate into the 480. Let's take a look through the lens of volume profile. It's really not much new commentary on this one. We know that there is still a volume shelf at the previous all time high, which makes total sense. All of this volume is fairly new at price. So not overly concerned with that right now, but there's two additional points I want to make before we drop it down to the daily time frame. First and foremost, as we've described in the 2001.com era bubble bursting, as well as the great financial crisis near 2008, the weekly trend is going to change before you experience the watershed moments where everybody's like, oh my goodness, this is a painful bear market, right? And you can even see that back in 2022 as the Fed started to lift off the rate policy, right? So is there any indication that the market's going to come crashing down because we're suddenly jeopardizing the weekly trend? The answer to that question is absolutely not. The next thing to point out here is there's a lot of commentary online right now about a parabolic breakout here in the S&Ps. I would argue that this is far from parabolic and this is a normal and healthy bull market breakout here. If you want to see an example of a parabolic move, look no further than SMCI on a weekly time frame chart. This is a parabolic break. Is the SPY, S&P 500, ETF anywhere close to doing that? The answer is absolutely not. The last thing we'll check in on here is just the continued look at the extension from the Fibonacci cup and handle. And as we know, 520 is the target. There is 520. It's actually the upper edge of this week's expected move as well. I just want to reinforce as well that this 61.8 is confluence with the 477 down to 480. So on the daily time frame chart, let's first evaluate this week's expected move. If you're not familiar with this study, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. If we're contained by the upper bound, the number's at 519.32, implying a higher high, a new all-time high, and once again, it's confluence with the Fibonacci extension from the cup and handle pattern on the weekly. If we're contained by the lower bound, the number's at 506.36, implying a very nuanced higher low here. So technically it is bullish, but I would be very cautious around these lows. We'll talk about it in just a moment. In terms of daily trend, we have lows, higher lows, higher lows, and these are higher lows. They're firm higher lows because we did flip into an hourly downtrend. Along the way, we have high higher highs and a higher high with Friday's breakout. So just like the weekly time frame chart, we're sitting on the higher high. We know that we can afford a higher low pullback, but there is no indication of stronger sellers stepping up in this market, suggesting that a pullback is imminent. The reason I could say that confidently is because we do have a very strong close on the Friday session and even look one day back at Thursday. Thursday opens on a gap up. We'll dissect this on the hourly chart as well. Looks into the previous two day balance back down underneath and then closes back towards the opening print. It begs the question, if stronger sellers were truly going to take advantage of that early morning momentum, why were they, number one, unable to break down through these lows? And number two, why couldn't they just close the daily bar inside of that range, causing a failed breakout? Maybe there would have been the opportunity for a double top. It just simply did not take place on the daily time frame here. So walking forward, we know that there are only a couple of outcomes. We're either looking for trend continuation, maybe something like a day two, and then something into that 520 weekly target we were just describing, or any high Higher low pullbacks on the daily time frame chart over 509, the top of the balance in here, looks really good for trend continuation. You would have low and then a subsequent higher low. Let's concede the point though. What if we do not hold 509? Although there's no evidence of stronger sellers, let's just say that the entire Friday move is retraced. We're getting consolidation down here. I would be much more concerned about the daily chart on a lower high, not necessarily a lower low. So let's play the situation out, right? If we get a breakdown of 505.25 from here, down to here. Technically speaking, we are getting a daily lower low, right? But on the weekly chart, did we not just talk about whole, how holding this previous area of resistance now could act as support, beautiful higher low on the weekly. It's very close. And I think a little bit of discretion is required here. Again, the concern would come in when this starts to suggest there is your head and shoulders reversal after a lower high. Of course, if we just break down into the gap, there's absolutely thin structure in here. This is the Nvidia earnings gap, but we'll trade shorts through that. That's fine. But as of right now, this is certainly a back pocket situation based on everything we've walked through so far. There's really no evidence of stronger sellers stepping up. So if there's going to be a daily reversal, that's fine. But I would only feel more confident in that when and if there's a lower high on the daily chart, something that looks like this, or if there's a straight shot into the gap and then we're getting consolidation down here, that would change my tone. But as of right now, 
primary outcomes on the daily are really looking for something that does this or straight up continuation. If we do get continuation, an interesting take here is looking at a trend channel. If we are in this trend channel and if we are going to tag the upper bound, I would suggest that something around 516, 517 could be likely on the Tuesday or excuse me, Monday or Tuesday session of this week, then maybe a pullback, right? Would it not be unreasonable for day two continuation? There's 516. Then we come back for a pullback. There's your next daily high or low. Then we start pushing maybe back in the upward direction. Sure, that's rainbows and butterflies for our buyers. But as of right now, certainly seems like a reasonable possibility based on the lack of stronger sellers entering this market. The last thing to point out here on the daily goes back to that whole parabolic versus linear move. This is a linear trend channel. This is a parabolic move. So anybody who's saying that this rally is unsustainable in the S&Ps, I would tend to think twice about that assumption. On the hourly time frame chart, let's firstly agree that the trend is now up. We had previous equal lows in here and equal highs over here. We got the higher high and then higher low into the afternoon of Thursday's session. And of course, we're just sitting on a major higher high come Friday. So therefore, any higher lows, just like the daily chart over 509, make a lot of sense for continuation in the upward direction. If you wanted to get even more granular, it wouldn't be unreasonable to take out a Fibonacci from the low of Thursday up to Friday's higher. 38.2 here is close to 510.25. So this type of pullback that doesn't test 509 directly may also be a bullish indication. And you could do the same thing just examining the Friday range from the low up to the high. Even better would be a higher low pullback or just straight up consolidation over 511.50, then looking for a break over time. So those are your quick draw McGraw setups, but the more patient buyers might look for that retest through the thin structure retracement of the Friday session. What I really want to focus on again is the failure of the the sellers on Thursday's session. Let's dive into it here. On Thursday, we know we open on the PCE gap up. And again, PCE came in way hotter than what the Fed actually wants as a target, but it was at the expectation. And I guess the market liked that. Regardless, you can see in the lower wick of the first hourly bar, we started to get a gap fill reversal, which is always indicative of stronger buyers entering the market. So great. Buyers are trying to step up. We're breaking out of this as a multi-bar range. Notice the second hourly bar puts in a bearish three bar play. It's consolidating in the lower 50% of the first container bar. And then we actually break down through those lows and get some sort of lower wick inside of the two day range here. So at that point, there was momentum from our sellers. And once again, if they were going to make something stick, what would they have wanted to see happen? Well, first and foremost, bring in a lower low underneath these equal lows for trend continuation. Now we're just looking for a lower high or better yet, put in some sort of consolidation, give the sellers an opportunity to enter the position, looking for some sort of pennant, some sort of whatever. It doesn't matter. Any lower high under under 507 would have produced a bearish setup here. And instead, we got the exact opposite into the end of day on Thursday. Notice the lower wick on the second to last hourly bar there, green hammer, finds buyers on the retest that's staying outside of and above the Wednesday high. It's also above the morning breakdown point. That is a bullish flip from what could have acted as resistance back into newfound support. And the rest is history with the higher high breakout on Friday. So I really do believe it's important to understand the types of participants getting involved in this market. And as of right now, there's continuously a lack of evidence for stronger sellers trying to do more damage to the trend. The trend is up. And again, in the intro, we said quite literally, nobody should be surprised that the buyers were able to break out on the Friday session due to the interaction that we just walked through on Thursday. With that said, we'll throw on the Fibonacci's and anchored VWAP, see what type of confluence we're getting. We already looked at the individual session Thursday and Friday, but here is your VWAP band. Slowly over time, you have to imagine as and if we open up on you know Monday, Tuesday up here spending time over 509. These will creep slightly higher. Just being above the cluster of view apps in the first place is more bullish than bearish. You know, so, you know, I do believe 509 is a key level for that reason. Then the last Fibonacci we want to take is from here up to our most recent high, reinforcing the idea that, yeah, we might start to become a little bit more cautious on a break of the 38.2. Remember on the daily chart, we sort of mentioned how if there was going to be a larger move to the downside, it's after the lower high in here where we start to become concerned and we would have violated violated or broken the 38.2 at that time, or even better yet, like if the sellers are going to just give us a beautiful neckline for the in, uh, head and shoulders, I mean, that just is the 38.2. So 505.25, also a key uh, level for that reason. A uh, couple of things that I would just keep in your back pocket, lower edge of the weekly expected move is 506.36. If you're expecting the NVIDIA earnings gap to close, that's like a two sigma move to the downside. Because we've just walked through the example of not having any stronger sellers in this market, I'm not sure I would be betting on this unless 
you know, instantly on the Monday session, there's a large bearish engulfer. If on Monday we close out a bearish bar that looks like this daily close underneath 505.25, I'll certainly change my tone. But once again, dealing with probabilities, dealing with looking at the types of participants we have in this market really does not seem like a top of mind situation. What we really want to focus on here on the hourly chart and in the S&P, based on what I can see, is your higher low over 511.50 for consolidation and continuation. Pull back to 510.25 is also reasonable that we just saw. Then this at 509 makes a lot of sense on the daily chart. If we're underneath, we'll take it in stride and we'll be open to changing our tone. But as of right now, it seems like a lower probability outcome. Market internals are always supporting evidence exhibit A. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. I think what we want to do here is examine the Thursday session, considering that we just walked through how the sellers could have taken advantage of the early morning momentum and simply did not. So from a volume flow perspective, we had inflows on Thursday. That of course is bullish. The advanced decline line opening higher in trend, higher zone, finishing the day slightly underneath, but nowhere near the zero line. Once again, it's a bullish indication there. And if we look at the cumulative build out of the tick, it also closes positive. Now, I'm not, not going to sit here and lie to you. It's not like 5,000. It's not 6,000, 7,000, really, really strong, but it's definitely not bearish. And once again, we're thinking about, is there any evidence that the sellers could have had an upper edge there? And the answer is just simply no. The last thing I'll point out here on the internals is that the index score worked like magic on the Friday session. It tends to work best at alerting trend days as they're starting to unfold. Notice that the open there is strong. See how strong these reads are compared to flat reads on the open Wednesday and Thursday when it's a little bit more choppy, Tuesday even. Um, I will say on Thursday, there was a fake out in the morning. See how strong this opened up here. That was due to the gap up, I believe. So we might have to consider how the indicator acts around gaps, but so far in forward testing, really, really pleased with what happened on Friday, the way that this indicator built out into the close, really, really strong support supporting the idea that this was a rally worth respecting in the S&Ps. Market profile is always exhibit B. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. Let's kick things off with a look at our value area and point of control. Here it is on Wednesday. Here it is on Thursday, drifting in the upward direction. And here it is on Friday, migrating towards the top of the range. Point of control is at the top of the range. That would validate the breakout buyers, but it does start to become slightly concerning from an overhead supply perspective. We know that longs late to the party can now more easily be converted into overhead supply, furthering the nature of any potential pullbacks. The key level I would watch out for here on the market profile specifically is the value area low at 51.20. 51.20, interestingly enough, is also a Fibonacci retracement from the low of Thursday up to the high of Friday. Let me just bring that over a little bit further. There you go. Your 61.8 is basically the 38.2 if you inverted where we began the clicks from, and that is the value area low. So if we get consolidation up here, it's the bull flag consolidation we were just referring to on the hourly candle chart, and that makes a lot of sense to me. 51.20 in the ES. Let's remove that. And I do want to take a closer look at the spike from Thursday and the open from Friday, right? So classically, spike rules would tell us that if we're opening at or below the base of the spike, which is technically right where we opened on the Friday morning session, in theory, these buyers into the afternoon of Thursday are rejected. They're invalidated, right? And you can even see in the A period here, we do get some price acceptance underneath, or at least some price interaction underneath the base of the M period spike. So in theory, once again, sellers should take hold there or buyers should just close out causing downward pressure. It simply did not take place. And instead the market took off to the upside producing a trend day. In theory, again, going back to spike rules, a better look for a trend day would have been opening over the top of the spike, making the market auction higher, looking for sellers at some unknown point, right? We're moving into blue sky territory. So the fact that we still opened under the base or at the base of the spike, and yet we're still able to produce a trend day higher speaks volumes to me that the buyers are totally totally in control of this market. While we're zoomed in, I do want to point out that we have okay excess at the lows of Friday session. But if we move on up to the highs of Friday session, we certainly have the lack of material excess here. So could this high use some repair? The answer is yes. And that would suggest trend continuation in the upward direction. Changing gears to the QQQ NASDAQ 100 on the monthly time frame chart. What do we see here in terms of candle structure and location? Just like the S&P 500 solid green bodied bar for the month of February, closing at the highs of the monthly range. 
in terms of bar to bar count, we've got a higher low as well as a higher high. So buyers go two for two. We're definitely in an uptrend here. There is no indication of a stronger pullback being imminent, but if something were to unfold, we know that a higher low over the previous all time high makes a whole lot of sense for something that does this, or a deeper pullback could still yield a monthly higher low over 380 loosely as the breakout point from the cup and handle pattern right over here. If we zoom out on this chart, I just want to remind you that the pullback over 2022, and I say pullback, uh, you know, we know what it was like intraday in here, but pullback on the monthly chart in 2022 went much deeper than the 38.2. It went all the way down to the 61.8. So for that reason, I would not take a measured move approach to measuring this as a bull flag breakout. You could do it for the fun of it, and I believe we've probably done it in videos in the past, but it's not as serious as what we have over in the S&P. If we take a look at the cup and handle, though, the magnitude of this move here to build the cup is actually much larger than what we have in the S&Ps on a relative basis. We know that the S&P weekly chart could hit 520, right? That's reasonable. That's within the realm of possibility. In the QQQ, I would find it very unlikely that in the coming week's worth of trade, we hit the measured move target from the cup and handle, which currently sits somewhere closer to roughly 475. So with that said, let's move on down to the weekly chart and see what is more reasonable for the upcoming week's worth of trade. We've broken out of this as a balance range. So again, let's stay committed to the process. We've got ourselves candle structure and location. Structurally, we're a little bit stronger here in the NASDAQ compared to the S&P, much less of a lower wick, indicating that the pullback was not as severe or the breakout on a relative basis was a little bit more in terms of magnitude. That, of course, is bullish. On the bar to bar count, we've got ourselves a higher low as well as a higher high. So good to go. Bulls are on parade. If we bring out a couple of Fibonacci retracement levels, we're not even close. And I really wouldn't argue that these are in force. This perhaps is interesting around 410 still. I would say because we've broken out of a multi-week balance right here, probably don't want to fall underneath this. If we do, I suppose that would be more similar to the breakdown of 490 in the S&P achieving 480 in the S&P. So what's the level here in the QQQ NASDAQ? We've got 425. If you break down underneath 425 on the weekly, maybe that deeper pullback is in force. And let's just see if we come from here to here, is it the 38.2? Yeah, look at that. Beautiful, right? So 425, 38.2 from this perspective. If you break down through it, you move to the larger 38.2, which is right on over there. Let's bring out the anchored view apps on the weekly time frame. And once again, folks, I want to be very clear that the candle structure and location would not suggest that the pullbacks we're talking about are imminent. I'm just giving you the levels and the confluence. So if something happens out of the blue, you have something to be prepared with. This uh, view app is slowly going to produce confluence with 425. I think it's just reinforcing that as a level. On the weekly time frame chart, ideally, we continue to move into blue sky territories. We get a full rotation out of this as a range. A range double brings us a little bit higher, probably closer to what's the cursor saying? Somewhere around 453 on the QQQ weekly. Let's go on over to our volume profile, and we won't need to reinforce the same ideas about weekly downtrends, right? You can see that before the larger move in the downward direction here on the NASDAQ. It's the same thing as what we talked about in the S&Ps, and the move is also not parabolic. You're not really learning anything about the volume shelf. Maybe actually this is interesting. There's much more protrusion out of the QQQ because the balance was more pronounced, and lo and behold, that level, love to see it, right? So 425, again, as the high volume node. If we break down underneath it, which again, there is no indication of, but if we break down underneath it, maybe that deeper pullback to 410, 412 unfolds, but as of right now, it is not a top of mind priority. The higher time frames are in alignment with the bullish trade continuing in the upward direction. Daily time frame chart as we start to get granular here is the weekly expected move. The upper edge is at 453.32. If we continue, obviously it's a new higher high in the trend count, new all time high. And if we're contained by the lower bound, the number is at 437.85. That of course implies a higher low from here to here. It's a much more meaningful higher low compared to what we have in the S&P. And what you'll notice is the lower edge is sort of confluence with this breakout point. So for that reason, really wouldn't want to exceed the lower edge of the expected move purely based on a trend point of view. If we're thinking about trend, there was much more of a threat in the NASDAQ. Remember, we had lows, higher lows. This was a lower low. This is now acting as your next higher low in the trend count. And on Wednesday, again, fully admitting, I was a little bit more concerned about a NASDAQ breakdown. We did not see a you know purely inside bar. We technically swept Tuesday's low. We closed weak compared to the S&Ps. I thought that maybe we were going to look into the NVIDIA earnings gap. It simply was not the case. Thursday comes around and we break out of this in the upward direction, bringing a higher high. And therefore, we can now afford 
afford a higher low on the QQQ daily. And as we just described, the ideal structure to hold is closer to the lower edge of the weekly expected move at 438.50. The previous all-time high from this session, the Friday of two weeks ago, is at 440.60. But I think on the hourly chart, you'll see that this is probably the level we want to align with. Once again, 438.50 as your higher low pullback on the daily time frame. If we were to slip to the downside, I would really just be focused on this level, right? This, of course, gets us on edge because now we've got ourselves a fake breakout. But then the short actually comes into play when and if we break into the NVIDIA earnings gap, which is underneath 433.75. Your big first test, which at this point probably is not as important considering the newest higher high, but maybe something at 430. And then, of course, the gap closes down here at 425.75. Just like the S&P, consider the magnitude of the, let's like, again, what is that? That's at least a two and a half, if not three plus sigma move to the downside. Seems unlikely considering that there is no evidence here on the daily time frame chart of stronger sellers truly getting involved in the NASDAQ. Once again, like the S&P, Thursday was a massive failure for our sellers. And we can see that even more so pronounced on the hourly time frame chart. As we take a closer look, notice that we looked over, you can see this level right here. In the morning session, we looked over that breakout point. And this is a very flat top, right? Classically speaking, that's like you could call that a launch pad. You could call that whatever you want to call it. It's really where the buyers should get some momentum in the upward direction, right? Uh, either shorts are closing out, shorts who are positioned in here, or buyers just recognize that we have a flat top breakout. It did not take place. So there's step number one for the sellers having more of the upper edge. Just like in the S&Ps, we break down into the Wednesday range in the lower wick of the third hourly bar, but there is no sticking point. There is no continuation from the sellers. So if the sellers were going to make something happen, you already had this breaking down to this on Wednesday, a failed breakout at the high. You're back down in this range. This starts to look like a big old failed gap up. Then, of course, the sellers just wanted this, and it simply did not take place. There was no breakdown underneath 434.65 or 433.75 to represent the top of the NVIDIA earnings gap. So as of right now, no evidence in the NASDAQ either for stronger sellers truly getting involved. We know that the trend is up with our right shoulder higher low here along the way highs, higher highs, and of course, higher highs on Friday. We'll give you the same Fibonacci perspectives. We'll come in from the low of Friday up to the high of Friday. So that 38.2 is loosely around 444 flat. And we'll also come in from the low of Thursday up to the high of Friday. That 38.2 is actually quite closely aligned with confluence at the 61.8 of the Friday individual range. But nonetheless, the level is 442.15. So any consolidation up here is about as bullish as it gets. Once again, over 444. And if we do get a little bit stronger of a pullback, that's fine. No issues from this point of view. Still holding up over that 442.15. 442.15 is that confluence. 61.8 and 38.2. Line in the sand on the daily, as we know, is back down over here. 438.50 lower edge of the weekly expected move for all of the reasons that we've just discussed. There's really not much going on here that we would want to see. Like, yeah, is it technically a higher low over the retest level? Absolutely. But there's not much in that singular bar and upper wick compared to what we have at the 438.35. So for those reasons, you know where my head's at. We're thinking about day two continuation in the upward direction. We're thinking about the opportunity for pullbacks over both of the levels we just discussed, as well as 438.50 acting as a major line in the sand. If there is going to be a larger reversal in the downward direction to potentially close the gap below, and again, so you're really talking about a three plus sigma move this week if it were to unfold. Seems unlikely, but if it were to unfold, you really want to see a move into the range, a lower high underneath 438.50. And then, of course, you've just got yourself a very classic head and shoulders. As of right now, once again, I just want to be very clear. So everybody's on the same page, right? Any higher lows via a double bottom, via an inverted head and shoulders, via a very simple hourly hammer candle that are above, I drew in at 440, but remember, it's really this level down here. That's my fault. 438.50 are good to go back in the upward direction trading for blue sky territories. Let's check in on the uh, anchored view apps here intraday and, you know, beautiful. I mean, they're all clustered there right now at 438.50, reinforcing the idea we've just set forth. Here are the NASDAQ internals. I would argue, again, Thursday is the day we really want to focus on. It wasn't as bullish as the S&P. Notice that we closed a little bit weaker here instead of up here on a relative basis to the S&Ps. And the tick, the cumulative tick out of the NASDAQ was actually slightly bearish on the Thursday session. Regardless, 
I wouldn't say we had a stronger edge to the sellers, right? If the, if the sellers were really going to make something happen with that morning momentum, the morning should have really built out a stronger cumulative build to the downside. This should have rolled over under the zero line. This should have got closer to the zero line and the advanced decline line just simply didn't take place out of the NASDAQ. So once again, just reinforcing the idea that we do not have stronger sellers entering the marketplace. Here are the NASDAQ futures for the market profile. And the takeaway is almost identical to what we had in the S&P value area. It does migrate in the upward direction direction, validating the breakout buyers on the Friday session. But now the risk is that we have overhead supply. If we were to break down, it's really just back down inside of the multi-day balance, which is this area down here, where we would become concerned. So underneath the low of the Friday session, yeah, now, now we're like, okay, what's going on here? Why are we back down underneath the level? And in the NQ futures, that's loosely 18.1. 18.1 in the NQ futures, great excess low on the A period. Notice that there is no B period overlap uh, to make a new lower low. We don't even come close. And in the NQ, we actually opened inside of the spike instead of underneath the base of the spike. So it's a little bit stronger of a takeaway for our buyer great excess at the lows and just like the S&P's lack of material excess at the highs indicating if we need to repair that level it wouldn't be unreasonable for continuation higher do we have multiple strings of single prints yes we do I would pay attention to them but again really just trying to align with higher lows looking for potential buyers uh, these are just reference points There's really nothing major to take away other than the buyers retain full control based on all of the evidence that we can see across all of the different time frames Changing gears again this time over to the IWM Russell 2000, the small caps on a monthly time frame chart. What do we see in terms of candle structure and location? Solid green bodied bar, but a little bit more of a lower and even upper wick than what we witnessed over in the S&P and the NASDAQ. Not the end of the world. The buyers did still do a great job closing strong near the highs of the monthly range in terms of bar to bar count, higher low as well as a higher high. Buyers go two for two. And the most important part about the monthly time frame is the fact that we're breaking out of a long standing monthly balance, right? Prior rejections rejections, 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 even in the upper wick of that green body bar, we've now closed above that. So if we're looking for a range breakout, typically the range double is the target. And the range double does take us higher than the structural target I would really encourage you to pay attention to. Everybody can see this. It's a flat top here at 230. I would not look directly for the range double, which is high 230s, 237, 238 as a measured move target. And again, this is not happening tomorrow, next week, or even the week after that. This is potentially months down the line. But as of right now, this is a constructive and healthy bullish breakout of the balance range. If we take a look from a couple of Fibonacci points of view, let's come in from the sickness low to the all-time high, just reinforcing that January was a higher low over the 38.2, and now we're continuing that move in the upward direction. That, of course, is bullish. If we come in from the all-time high to the lows of the balance range, we would really like this to recapture the 61.8 for stronger odds of a retracement in the upward direction. So still some work to do on that front. You would want to clear 213 here on the the monthly. Let's drop it down to the weekly time frame and see what else we can learn about the price action here. Solid weekly bar, obviously solid green body bar speaks for itself. Minimal upper wick, virtually no lower wick as well. So buyers are in control in terms of the count. We've got a higher low as well as a higher high. And notice it's the first closing high over these upper wicks as well. It's very similar to what we just saw on the monthly time frame. So if this is a bull flag, which it totally is coming in from these lows up to these highs even, this is starting or trying to break as of Friday's close. Even if we were to get a pullback, I would probably now want to see a higher low over this 38.2. That's loosely around 199. Ding, ding, ding. We've got a winner. What do we know about 199 on the daily time frame chart? If you don't know, we'll get to it in just a moment. Before we go to the daily, I want to reinforce the idea on a five-year chart. Let's bring out the anchored view apps here. And what we'll notice is that all of them are clustered below. So the weekly support of this higher low is really paramount going forward. We already recognize that it is a 38.2. So ideally, we don't pull back. But if we do, this is OK. The only risk on the weekly chart is if this turns into a double top and we actually break on down underneath loosely 190, we start jeopardizing these uh, anchored view apps as a band of support underneath us. That would be a larger issue as of right now does not appear to be a threat based on the weekly close as well as the monthly close that we just saw on the higher time frames. If we bring out the volume profile on the IWM small caps, what we'll also remember is that clearing the top of this range is really opening the door through a thin low volume void overhead. The larger target is really this high volume node, which is shy of the flat top at 230, but much closer to loosely 225 as a potential target in the upward direction. So watching out for those indications. Let's bring it on down to a daily time frame chart now and really start to understand. Let's go over the IWM. There we go. Let's really start to understand that 
199. So again, for the folks who maybe do not know or haven't been tuning into the channel, 199 represents the neckline of this as the original double bottom on the daily that cemented the weekly higher low, right? This is the weekly higher low zone. This reverses the daily trend back in the upward direction. And we just saw it as the 38.2 fib coming from this low up to this high. So as long as we can hold over 199 going forward, that to me looks constructive on the daily time frame for a possible higher low. We're sitting on the highest high in the trend count. We've got lows, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. This could offer higher lows, especially if the daily 50 SMA wants to offer confluence. 199 is looking pretty darn attractive at this point. Are there any indications though on the daily chart that stronger sellers are emerging here? And the answer is no. We certainly had some volatile range back here, but as we've started to push back in the upward direction, the lack of gap close on the Wednesday session is really the giveaway to me that continues to suggest that stronger sellers aren't here. If they were, there would have been no problem fighting back into Monday's range going sideways and continuing this sort of consolidation and compression. Obviously, the buyers stepped up and continued to break things in the upward direction, which of course is bullish for the broad market. The lower edge of this week's expected move is $200.78, and the upper edge of this week's expected move is $211.07, loosely confluence with $411.50 as a structural target overhead above the 208 level that we've talked about in previous videos. So on the daily chart, consolidation here keeps us, you know, optimally bullish. And then we're looking for a breakout of a new balance range right around in this zone. If we break down underneath and close the gap from the Wednesday remainder, if you will, that's under 201.50 right here, I would look for the retest of 199 and see if buyers can step up there. I'm not convinced that again, exceeding the lower edge of the weekly expected move is a higher probability outcome, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. Remember, expected moves are always just a suggestion from the options market. Before we go on down to the hourly chart, I want to look at the XRT, which is the retail sector. And what we want to do is take a look at the weekly chart here, just to illustrate that again, this is much more so aligned with small caps. Breaking out here is a tailwind for the IWM, I would argue, to some degree. It's not directly one to one, but you get the idea. And the same thing with the XBI, biotechs, right? Here you can see you've got these equivalent ranges and they're starting to break in the upward direction. Some small supporting evidence that smaller cap companies can continue uh, this move in the upward direction, or at least it's validating the breakout that we're trying to look for over in the IWM. Let's go on over to the hourly chart though, and see what's happening from that point of view. Here we go down to the hourly. There we have it. And you can see that there's not much to really talk about in terms of dissecting the price action. Definitely a gap up on the PCE move faded into the range, consolidated. Again, if stronger sellers were going to emerge, there was not really a threat to these lows, but the consolidation should have stuck into the end of day there. It did. And then obviously on Friday, it's back off to the races, making a new higher high, exceeding the upper edge of last week's expected move. So again, I'm not seeing any reason why the small caps appear to be a threat for the broad market as a whole right now. They're doing everything they should be doing to push away from 199 to show us that buyers are strong, sellers are weak, and the broadening nature of the market rally is truly becoming a reality. Let's take a look at what's happening from an intraday view app point of view. All of these are below us. So again, that does speak to bullish odds improving. The longer we can stay above, the more bullish the market is. Obviously, we're clearly in an hourly uptrend. I know I've sort of glanced over some things here in the IWM, but no need to overcomplicate it. I think as a bellwether gauge for the market, this is constructive. The breakout here is certainly what you want to see if you're especially an S&P bull, right? As the market rally broadens out means that we don't have to rely as much on things like your NVIDIA. Now, don't get me wrong. They're still going to be very impactful, the Magnificent 7, but this is a good step in the right direction. We'll also see very similar comments out of the RSP. What about the market internals for the Russell side of the market? Things are looking good again on Thursday. That's where the sellers could have made something happen. Even with that consolidation week into the close, the breadth was positive here. The advanced decline line is in uh, positive territory, as is the cumulative build into the close. I would have thought, especially noting the weakness on that Thursday session, even though it was a gap up, right? I would have thought that the cumulative build would have flipped negative. Certainly not the case. And once again, speaks to the lack of stronger sellers in small caps. And this is constructive. I can't say it enough for the broad market as a whole. Lastly, for the IWM are the Russell futures here. Just to take a look at the overhead supply, I would make the argument here that you just want to watch your value area low, which is much closer to the top of the range compared to what we just saw in the S&P. So some sort of breakdown underneath 2070, under 2070 in the Russell starts to become interesting for a bit of a stronger pullback. And once again, what would you watch for? I'd be thinking 2062. And then beyond that, we already know that on the daily time frame chart, we're looking at 199 IWM. And in the Russell futures, that's 2020. That's way down here. Certainly would not seem like a threat 
immediately. Uh, but if this does turn into overhead supply and we take out all these lows, eh, maybe 2020 could be in the cards. So one step at a time, 2070 will be your gatekeeper value area low early on in the week. If we're consolidating above, it's nothing but bullish for the broad market. If we do slip it to the downside, looking for a higher low, if we can catch that higher low, again, bullish for the broad market. Let's go back on over to the charts here and just give you the example on IWM in case this is a bit more, uh, you know, understandable, digestible, I suppose is a more appropriate word. So this healthy, nothing wrong, looking for upside. Break underneath 205, a little bit of a lower high here can yield some sort of pullback, but watching for the cluster of anchored view apps to offer some sort of support. And as long as the daily higher low is over 199, not really concerned with any pullbacks in small caps, looking for the breakout to continue over time, as long as the trend remains up on the higher timeframes. Let's take a look through the performance of our S&P sectors here on the week. Leading the pack is the SMH, not an S&P sector, but certainly semis are important right now, up 4.72%, followed by real estate. That's a head scratcher, right? Oh my goodness. Real estate is a lightweight sector. It's slightly deeper for defensive. Why is that leading the pack? Well, it really boils down to what's going on with rates here. It's followed by the XLK. Ah, that's a sigh of relief. Things are feeling good. That's the heaviest weight risk on style sector. Awesome. Followed up by the XLY, another heavier weight risk on style sector. I would say that posture up here is fairly bullish, especially making note that at the bottom of the barrel, the XLV is technically red on the week, down almost 1%, followed by the XLP. Both of those are D for defensive. Unfortunately, the XLV is the second heaviest weighted sector by market cap, but if any of the you know heavyweight sectors are going to lag, that's the one we want to lag. So all good on that front. Let's take a look at the actual structural charts here and really understand what's taking place. SMH, any issues with this? We're going to do a speed round today. No, no issues with this. Higher lows available. Breakout to blue sky territories, bulls in control. That, of course, is supportive of the S&P new all-time high. Real estate breaking out to the upside from this as a range. You could maybe even call it an inverted head and shoulders over 39. Upward pressure is upward pressure. Is it a defensive risk off move? Absolutely not. We're moving along. Next up, the XLK breaking to a new all time high outside of these highs, just like the QQQ, watching for higher lows over 208 or even deeper higher lows over 205. Anything over the NVIDIA earnings gap up, really. If you break down into the NVIDIA earnings gap up, yeah, we'll probably see some deeper pullback in the S&P 500 itself. But as we know, weekly higher low is definitely definitely possible up and over that gap fill reversal at 199.25. So keeping it simple, bulls or bears in control, definitely the buyers here that is supportive of the new S&P 500 all-time high. XLY, continuing the move in the upward direction, breaking from this balance range, grinding in the upward direction. No big glaring red flags on the Thursday or Friday price action. No structure that we need to pay attention to. So definitely more bullish than bearish, supportive of the move in the upward direction. Materials making a move towards that 88. Wouldn't be surprised to see some pullback off of that structural level. This is a really lightweight sector though. So is it going to be make or break for the market? Absolutely not. If it pulls back here, that's fine. We know that we're definitely in an uptrend. It's not going to be a big concern. If it really starts to break back down into 84 range down here, now we've got a red flag. As of right now, it doesn't seem like a big threat into the coming weeks worth of trade. Energy could be inflationary. And we know that inflation is starting to become more of an issue for the Fed to pay attention to. It's not as good as maybe everybody thought, but inverted head and shoulders breaking out over this neckline, breaking out of this as a balance. I would say there's probably a more nuanced level in here around 86.50. If you're over 86.50, watching for this breakout to continue, probably looking for something around 89.15 uh, coming from all of these interactions in the past, a lot of price history around that level. So that's possibly inflationary. But as we know, it's also decent in terms of what it means for global demand for oil as a proxy for crude. And of course, economies do well when there's stronger demand for oil. If nobody wants anything, it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? What are you guys doing? Uh, so energy doesn't strike me as the end of the world. Again, if it was exhibiting leadership, if energy was like, oh my goodness, we're breaking out over 94, we're making new all-time highs. Yeah, now, now we've got issues. But as of right now, breaking out of this long-standing balance, not the end of the world. Next up, XLI. And I know we said we were going to do a speed round and keep the commentary to a minimum. And what do we do? We comment. Uh, anyways, XLI moving in the upward direction here. New all-time highs. That has to be bullish for the market. Let's stick to it from here on out. Here's the spiders. We already talked about them. XLC. I thought that the risk out of communications would have been for a breakdown into the uh, gap range down here. Simply wasn't the case. And as we know, if we can break out of 80, great. We're looking for a range double in the upward direction. That, of course, would act as a tailwind supporting the S&P 500 moving in the upward direction. A range double brings you probably just shy. That's maybe a bit of an exaggeration on the bull side with the uh, drawing there. Just shy of 82.15, call it 82 flat as a potential target that is bullish for our S&P 500. Even if we close the gap, we've talked about this in the past, there's an opportunity for a weekly higher low over the upward sloping daily 50 SMA. Next up, TLT, uh, just sort of showing where that is relative to the S&Ps. It's underneath. So on weekly performance, the S&Ps actually outperformed the TLT. Does that you sort of mean there's a flight to safety? Absolutely not. There is no flight to safety. Again, we'll check in on that when we get to the ratio 
chart in just a moment. Here's the XLU utilities. Uh, it was at the top of the list last week. And as of right now, it's right back down towards the bottom. Has it done anything impressive on the structural chart? The answer is absolutely not. Let it consolidate. Let it go sideways. Fine. No issues. As long as it's not breaking down underneath these uh, lows. Remember, lighter weight defensive sectors, we don't want them falling off of a cliff because downward pressure is downward pressure. This is fine. Really not seeing any concerns out of utilities. Financials, consolidation range. I would be looking for breakouts here to potentially continue the risk on rotation in the S&Ps. Let me say that one more time. Hopefully you made it to this point in the video. If you did, let me know what your favorite bank is down below. I've got a bone to pick with Chase right now. Uh, but anyways, uh, if this range can break in the upward direction, I'm not kidding. If this range can break in the upward direction, that, of course, in my eyes, would continue to fuel the move towards blue sky territories in the S&P or at minimum prevent a stronger drawdown, even if tech sees a pullback to potentially test the NVIDIA earnings gap. If XLF can break out here over 4045, that to me is an incredible sign of strength to continue what we're seeing in the S&P 500. Next up, XLV Healthcare. Uh, it's at the bottom of the barrel, but any issues structurally? Absolutely not. Lows, higher lows, higher lows. Coming from a higher high, great. I mean, it looks like an uptrend to me. If it looks like an uptrend, smells like an uptrend, must be an uptrend, uh, all-time highs. So no issues out of this, even though it's at the bottom end of the barrel. XLP, same idea. It's definitely in an uptrend. It's not making all-time highs, though, which is important because this is not the second heaviest weighted sector by market cap. So being defensive, we don't want it pushing towards those highs. If anything is, it's healthcare. And so far, that rotation has really been uh, helpful in 2023. Like end of 2023, 2024 beginnings here, really helpful what we've seen out of the healthcare sector. So, so far, so good out of the XLP, not seeing any posture concerns as we rip through the charts. Let's jump on over to the ratio grid and we'll just load this up in real time here uh, and we'll see what's going on. If you're not familiar with the screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right-hand corner. XLK recapture a flat or maybe slightly upward sloping 50 SMA that does speak to risk on. Again, what if this sort of takes a turn uh, and, and the baton is passed between sectors? We know that the XLK could pull back from the highest high in the trend cycle and the XLF could break out of the balance range. If that takes place, this moves higher. Maybe this pulls back a little bit and we still maintain a risk on look. XLV is pulling back here. That of course is a good thing. We don't want this leading the charge to the upside. And the XLY finally hit that 50 SMA. Mild pullback on Friday. We'll see if we can get continuation over the 50 SMA now, and that would speak to increased bullish odds here. Not an issue from a risk-off perspective, not an issue from a risk-off perspective. XLE is just flat, even though it's trying to break from that balance range, and real estate also a non-issue, even though it's towards the top of our list over here. So not seeing any concerns ratio-wise. Let's take a look at some specialized ratios. This continues to suggest risk on XLK SHY. What about XLK XLU utilities over here? Slightly different. Remember that we were sort of concerned with the possibility of a head and shoulders out of the pattern. And now we're back up towards the equal high. So risk on maintains itself as the primary look. What about our additional apples to apples, XLY, XLP? Great move in the upward direction. Higher high into the close of this week. Higher high from here to here, right? So to me, this is bullish and speaks to much more concretely risk on being the nature of this market. Let's continue. The last one here in terms of our specialized ratios, SMH, XLV. Right, So again, XLV has been performing quite well. We know it's in a very strong uptrend. We know it's making new all-time highs. So is the SMH. So when we look at this ratio, seeing this massive break to the upside, and obviously Friday was really what put the SMH up and over the edge, up 3% on the individual session, this speaks to risk on. Like Even if we get some sort of pullback, certainly an opportunity for a higher low, and the preference remains for our risk on drivers in the marketplace, not really seeing any concerns from that point of view. Let's take a look at the dollar, because the dollar also just didn't really do much in terms of offering a risk off sentiment all week. We know that there's an opportunity for a higher low here, but it never got back in gear to the upside, which is interesting, even on the heels of a hot PCE uh, report on Thursday. Right? A little bit of an uptick there, but nothing major, certainly not rebounding back up towards these equal highs. So that to me is a uh, is fairly interesting. And maybe some of that could be attributed to the big break in gold back to the upside. This is pretty incredible here. And a lot of folks are actually starting to look at this as possibly a risk off indication. And I can see where they're coming from, right? If you take a look at gold on a multi-year monthly time frame chart, let's go way out to like max available data here. Remember that this is a huge cup and handle near the all-time highs. And if this breaks out big time, you know, we're not going to do the math for the measured move, but it's huge, right? That's a huge move out of gold. And if that ultimately does materialize, what would that suggest about the tech sector? What would it suggest about risk on versus risk off? As of right now, I'm not yet aligned with, oh my goodness, duck and cover in the NASDAQ, but 
it's something to pay attention to. It's definitely something to pay attention to over here in gold. If that, if there is a breakout, like classically, that is defensive. Like we can't ignore that. It's something that I would continue to keep in my back pocket, but it's not enough to really go out and short the marketplace, right? I wouldn't go out and short the market because of what's happening here. As we know, if gold is going to break out, puts downward pressure on the dollar, technically that alleviates what's happening here in equities. You can see silver also. I thought it was the nail in the coffin over here with the little uh, indecisive doji and uh, following up the inverted hammer on Wednesday. Never Never broke down underneath, never broke down underneath 2250. Now one more opportunity to break the range in the upward direction coming off of potentially a higher low. We'll see. We'll see if this can break out. Maybe that leads gold and uh, really forces a stronger move out of the uh, yellow metal there. But one step at a time, if this breaks out, as we know, should be helpful for equities, at least in the immediate time frame. If some stronger issues start to emerge with, again, the whole idea of moving to risk off, we'll take it in stride, but we're not there yet. Let's take a look at interest rates because these broke down aggressively on the Friday session, which is bullish for the broad market. And what did we get on Friday? We got our uh, ISM PMI numbers, and we'll take a look at those in just a second. They did not come out great. So if this is breaking down, is it starting to be more so, hey, the Fed's not going to cut because they're going to be friendly and inflation still raging out of control, technically, according to the last read. But are they going to cut because their hand is forced to cut and things are dramatically deteriorating? I don't know. We'll take a look in just a second when we get to the fundamental rundown. But before we do so, let's check in on the inverted ZT. There is a contract change that took place over here. So no, that's not a true gap down, just a contract roll. Uh, but we are drifting slightly lower. So what would that suggest? Certainly that the odds of the June. We're really going to start focusing on June, right? The June timeframe cut is probably a go based on this moving in the downward direction. Let's check in on it now. So as expected, no changes in the March or May timeframe meeting. However, this is where the head scratcher starts to show up in the June timeframe, which is exactly what the inverted ZT was just suggesting. But the reason it's a head scratcher is because if you actually know what the odds were ahead of PCE, some guy, I guess, was wise enough to screenshot this. Anyways, you'll notice that we had 49.7% odds and we came in at the market's expectation, but 0.4 is nowhere near the Fed's target for inflation. So you would think the Fed's going to come out with a strong suit and say, no, we're higher for longer, or at least the market's going to see the reacceleration of inflation and start to price in higher for longer. And it was not the case. So is there something that's happening at a fundamental level that the Fed is not willing to acknowledge yet that is causing the market to price in these sort of cuts, even as inflation is potentially rebounding? I wouldn't say it's all the way there yet, but it's certainly not moving in the downward direction. It's not progressing in the right way. That to me is the next big question to answer. If we take a look at what's happening, this is what's upcoming for this week. So keep in mind, Powell will be testifying. It's the uh, biannual sort of commentary on monetary policy to Congress and the Senate and all that good stuff. I would really just expect some political back and forth, not going to really learn anything new. The larger deals will be the ADP non-farm, the JOLTS job openings, and then here is the true labor report coming out on Friday at 8.30. We will have coffee and donuts up in the penthouse suite. So far, the numbers based on the expectations are really in line with smooth sailing, nothing really overly jarring for the market. We'll see if those numbers come in with misses, but as of right now, this is not a concern. The market's not saying oh goodness, we're pricing in something bad, right? If we take a look at what happened into the end of last week, though, we really want to focus on uh, this right here. Manufacturing PMIs came in at a miss under 49.5 as the expectation. And just remember that over and under 50 represent expansion versus contraction. So 47.8, does that mean that we're sort of contracting to a greater degree and the Fed's going to have to intervene? Maybe that's one degree of why the tracker tool is pricing in higher odds for June. You're also getting the consumer sentiment here revised in the downward direction. Manufacturing prices also in the downward direction here, although that would sort of be a counterpoint to inflation, just speaking to uh, prices paid are less than what we had expected uh, and certainly less than what we had prior over here. If we look at some different inflation metrics, there's a couple of different stories that you might see. Super core inflation, which just excludes basically everything. It's no food, it's no energy, it's no housing, certainly has the highest print in two years. And that to me is very interesting, but we can sort of balance that out by actually looking at what the housing data came in at. You can see services inflation by itself was up 0.6 on the month over month read and the household and household utilities stuff, it was also up you know, at that threshold, basically 0.6. So even if you exclude housing, exclude energy, all that good stuff from the core readings, you're still paying lots higher prices, almost double on a month over month basis from December. 
So again, inflation working in the right direction? Absolutely not, based on the evidence in front of us here. This was a step sort of sideways, or maybe even in the backwards direction in terms of the progress that's been made so far. If we look at this information, this is ISM manufacturing, and if we look at new orders, everything, like new orders was down in blue here. But notice, the reason I point it out is because the previous read was actually substantially green over the zero mark. New orders contracted big time, they're negative here, as like employment fell, inventories fell, delivery, like everything fell. Everything was negative. And of course, this number has been negative for a while now, but we're starting to make strides back up towards zero. Back up and over the zero line would be sort of indicative of expansion. And I get it. GDP has still been strong, but it, this is like, why, why? What's going on here? And why is the Fed tracker tool pricing it in? So this is like my roundup of all the fundamental data points that sort of matter at this juncture in time. And we'll see what happens with the labor market next week. Labor market to me seems like it's going to be okay. Not really a big deal there. We know that the initial weekly claims have been fine. I do think that the 80, excuse me, the NFP, non-farm payroll, probably not as many jobs added. I think we're probably going to slow down there growth wise, but the unemployment side of things probably stable here at a 3.7, maybe a 3.8 missing by about a tenth of a percentage point. Uh, but outside of that, let's move along to earnings. This is interesting to me. If you look at this chart, can you objectively look and find where NVIDIA earnings were? You know, you can, of course, find the date, but this little blip to the upside is NVIDIA earnings. So you want to talk about one stock that's really driving the returns in the S&P at an earnings level. That's it. Notice what we had earlier, just completely sideways activity. Now we're even starting to flatten out again. And I get it. Earnings cycle is winding down. That's fine. Uh, but the expectations for earnings are not increasing in a big way. NVIDIA helped out a bunch and that's awesome. But from a fundamental point of view, that is a slightly concerning chart. If we take a look at who's reporting this week, nobody major, I would maybe say some honorable mentions here, go out to our CrowdStrike target, of course, consumer spending. Uh, that might be a little bit interesting there. If we continue to peer through this, Campbell's is just a classic, again, consumer staple spending there. Kroger, you know, kind of falls into that category. Same thing with Costco. Broadcom is up, you know, an ungodly amount already. So we'll see if they just mention AI a couple times and continue to pump it higher. BJ is also important. Uh, DocuSign, lower tier tech. That's really it on the earnings front in terms of honorable mentions. Maybe Marvel as well, chip maker over here. MongoDB, yeah, we'll throw it in the mix as well. I'd say that Thursday is probably your most important day. And then Tuesday also a little bit more influential than what we have on the Wednesday session and Friday and Monday, that is for sure. With that said, let's jump back on over to the platform though, and sort of continue through our risk assessment of the appetite of the market for risk. TLT ratio to the S&P is still sitting on these lows. So there is no flight to safety trade. We already talked about that when we mentioned in the lineup here that the uh, TLT is still sub the S&P in the actual uh, weekly performance category. One interesting thing, if you flip this and order by what happened on Friday, you'll actually notice that the TLT outperformed the S&P up 1.1% here, whereas the S&P was only up about three quarters of a percent. So one day is not going to make or break the market, right? But it is interesting as we were breaking out to a new all-time high that the TLT actually performed better. So just take that for what you will. If we look at bonds in relationship to themselves, let's move along to this, starting to continue that deterioration. So this looks good. This looks good in terms of risk appetite remaining stable for equities down below in the lower pane. Let's look at credit spreads. No issues out of these. Maintaining stable and sideways looks. No issues there in terms of credit event and credit risk. Here's the HYG in isolation. The largest concern is if we break down underneath 7660 as the market continues to grind in the upward direction. A stable HYG, not the end of the world, but certainly would be nice if it starts breaking out and playing catch up to the S&P to offer some sort of lockstep movement, not necessarily so divergent, right? This, this activity of lower highs and just sideways down here really does not add up and sit well with a lot of folks for equities down below. At, you know, at the end of the day, we always say price action rules, and that's sort of it. This is one data point in the entirety of today's analysis. So take that for what you will. But HYG, probably more meaningful underneath 7660. Let's move along and talk about Bitcoin bull flag consolidation starting again. Little inside bars forming up here. As long as we're over six, uh, 6970, $60,970 per coin, we're looking at bull flag consolidation potentially continuing. That, of course, is stronger risk appetite for financial instruments as a whole. What about market breadth? It certainly improved last week as we moved in the upward direction towards that new all-time high. Here are new highs versus lows ticking in the upward direction. That, of course, is bullish. SPX A200R still flattening out, but sideways on the week in these highs. That, to me, is a solid sign. As long as we're not breaking down for a lower low and getting closer to the 50% mark, all good out of this indication. What about the SPX A50R creeping back higher? Again, inverted head and shoulders is 
the look. Anything that does this would be constructive for the broad market as a whole to sustain this rally or at least prevent deeper pullbacks over here in the S&P when and if the core list, the Magnificent 7, really has a fall from grace, which as of right now doesn't really look to be a strong outcome. Apple is an outlier, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but for now, RSP, equal weight S&P 500, playing catch up to the all-time high. Remember that this is not just a market that's solely driven by the Magnificent 7. Do they help? Of course they help. It's a cap-weighted index. However, this is indicative of stronger participation at all levels of the index, which of course is a bullish indication. Here is the QQQE. It's basically in lockstep with the NASDAQ, so all good on that front. And the Dow Jones Industrials versus Transports continues to be divergent. This is making new highs, and this is still stuck sideways in the range. Again, just like the HYG being divergent, it's one data point, especially the Dow, which is not cap weighted, by the way. Uh, the Dow being divergent here is not necessarily the end of the world, in my opinion, at least if you're an S&P trader. If you're someone who trades the Dow, of course, this is probably top of mind for you. But for us, it's sort of a lower tier data point. What about volatility? Certainly didn't do anything uh, this week. It sort of came out of the market on the PCE release, which is to be expected, right? The market's sort of uh, getting all sort of fired up and it's getting all anxious. And then the PCE comes out, all good, release that tension. And that's what we see to the downside out of the VIX. We'll watch to see if this trend line continues to hold up. If so, it sort of indicate that it wouldn't be unreasonable for a move higher out of the VIX earlier on in the week. We're at the trend line. What would that spell for the market? Some sort of pullback. What did we just talk about on the S&Ps? We know that a pullback is okay as long as they're over 509. So any concerns from volatility? Absolutely not based on that indication. VIX is still floored down below at complacency zone. So like we said in the intro, we are not going to get complacent, but it does look like the market's getting a little bit complacent near these all-time highs. What about volatility futures? Strong contango that is bullish. Strong contango that is bullish. And the one-day VIX is suppressed down towards these lows. Certainly not elevated, no issues from a volatility point of view, but keep your wits about you for a potential pullback based on the VIX trend line. If you've made it to this point in the video, I'm sure you're enjoying the analysis. Do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel so we can get to 100K by May. Brian Rutherford coined the term and it flows beautifully right off the tongue. So shout out to Brian. We're going to start using that more frequently around these parts. But Apple kicks off the core list of companies. What do we see on the daily time frame? Certainly a long awaited breakdown of the 180.25 level. Remember that we had consecutive daily lower highs coming into that zone. But look at the daily bar that printed. It's technically a hammer candle. So on the hourly chart, I really think that there are two outcomes we want to try to align with here. Number one would just be continued stagnation or struggle around 180.25 to me. Really looks more so like a break lower high on the retest of the level. And then we're looking for downside continuation. Ultimately, the larger target is here at 173.75. If the buyers are going to regain control, and if this right here is just going to be a look below and fail, as we know what we're looking for is a higher low now above 180.25. So I would not be long on the cross through 180.25, but instead, when and if the buyers clearly display some sort of strength with a higher low above that level. So 185 is the key zone. And of course, the look below and fail always targets the top end of the range, something that would look like this perhaps over time. 184 would be that number. We'll take it in stride from there. Still a strong possibility for daily lower highs up against 187.50 and the daily 50 SMA here in blue. Let's move along to Microsoft. What's going on with Softy? Decent display of strength into the end of the this week, making an equal high to this one back here. If we can cross up and over 415.75, there's some room to run, and we're basically aiming at blue sky territories after that. 419.25 is a possible target where this lower high came from. If we do get consolidation, of course, it wants to be over 412.50. If you just extend that off to the left, remember your previous flat top, consolidation above, rejections below, rejections below. Now we want to see that act as support. So 412.50 key line in the sand for bullish consolidation, looking for follow through in the upward direction. If we slip underneath, it's not the end of the world. There's still an opportunity for a pie in the sky, sort of one of these guys, inverted head and shoulders. There is an opportunity for a daily higher low up and over 409.50, but 412.50 would make more structural sense based on history over here. That's Microsoft in a nutshell. More bearish when and if we breach and close below 409.50 for the lack of that higher low. Next up, we've got Google, which is just a no touch at this point. Uh, it could not really get anything going on the Friday session into the close for an inverted head and shoulders, right? If this was really going to break, you wanted to see price 
price up and over 138.75 simply did not take place. And instead we breached to the downside to close out the week. So as of right now, thinking about this through the lens of bear flag consolidation, where do we participate to the downside? Any subsequent lower highs below 137.65 are playable. If we miss that, let's just say it's a straight shot lower. Consolidation here breaks lower highs on like a five or 15 minute chart are tradable under 135.75. And on the daily time frame chart, we can see where our targets are coming from down below. Daily 200 SMA in green will be confluence with the 133.50. And then here we have 130.150. If it is going to turn around, I would really only be bullish on Google. If it could recapture 140, maybe some of these gaps like Swiss cheese are in play overhead, but one step at a time as of right now with the whole fundamental story with Gemini really getting bashed, I would try to stay away uh, and look more so for the bearish setups. Let's look at Amazon up next. What's going on with Nancy here? Uh, moving in the upward direction, not yet at all time highs, just as a reminder that's much further overhead at 188.65. Let's drop it down to the hourly chart just so we can get a bit more granular and really understand what's happening here. So earnings range, obviously on the gap up, higher low above, making a higher high into the end of this week. Very straightforward. Higher lows over 176 are rock and roll in the upward direction. Equal high as a first target. Or if we get continuation higher first, so there is no pullback, I would start thinking about where is the reversal on the hourly chart to trade for the pullback off of 179.50. Still trying to align with the higher low at 176 or above 176 if we can spot the reversal via some sort of hourly double bottom, inverted head and shoulders hammer, all the same things that we're always talking about here. Line in the sand out of Amazon would not want it underneath the breakout point at 175. If we're underneath that, I would start to think, okay, why is this a failed breakout? Why are we back down underneath this more substantially? And then for me, how can we get involved on the breakdown to close the gap here underneath 172.35? It's not a primary objective because of how we closed out on Friday, but it's one back pocket situation. NVIDIA, the one stock to rule them all, still on the uh, hourly time frame chart. You can see a strong break on the Friday session. Semis were up big time, up 3% in the index itself. Any higher lows go over 802.85. So very straightforward chart getting a little bit of pullback off of that all-time high, a little bit of slowdown, if you will, into Friday afternoon. If it pulls back like this, higher lows here remain constructive outside of this as a balance range. Once again, that level is 802.85. If we get the lower high underneath 802.85, sort of unlike Apple or the inverse of Apple, it would be a look above and fail, and the target's always the bottom end of the range. In this case, it would be 773 and possibly beyond that. Notice that we have very thin structure over here, very precise lows. If you break down underneath that level, there's nothing saying that a stronger retest of this level at 741.25 couldn't be in store. Next up, we've got the metaverse. What's going on with Zuckerberg's Fantasyland? New all-time highs on Friday, breaking out of this balance range, keeping the XLC as an index afloat, or I should say ETF afloat, a sector ETF. Um, so for the most part, higher lows. You're looking, how can we participate in the move to the upside? We got the breakout and we got the consolidation over the earnings gap up range. That's this move right here. We got the continuation play on Friday. How can we continue to participate? You probably don't want to just be blindly chasing longs up here, but any pullbacks that start to break down underneath 499.75, can we get a higher low retest over the top of this range at 490? Can we align with hourly double bottoms down here, inverted head and shoulders, the whole nine yards, again, everything that we typically discuss, 490 would be the key retest or just straight up consolidation here for maybe a day, sweep the low, come back above, how do we get involved on something that looks like that? The name of the game is to get involved on a risk-friendly entry here in the upward direction because it's bulls on parade, let me tell you, out of the metaverse and Zuckerberg's fantasy land. Next up, Tesla, what do we see out of Mr. Musk and the rocket ship suing AI, open AI, that is, even though he was a previous, I don't know, in in investor or founder. I don't know if he was quite a founder, but certainly uh, injected some serious startup capital there. We'll see how that unfolds. It's very interesting. Sam Altman uh, replying back to a tweet that was over five five years old on X. Very just funny stuff, the world that we live in here. But anyways, Tesla moving in the upward direction, building block in the upward direction, nothing more than an hourly balance range. So keep it simple. Over 206, looking for the daily 50 SMA at 212.50. Consolidation near the midpoints, not so clear. Consolidation above, lean on the bullish thesis. Consolidation in the lower portion, under 201.75. Maybe there is a breakdown. Maybe this does turn into overhead supply, but as of right now, it's certainly not a top of mind indication. I would tend to think that this, if anything, is an hourly double bottom. If we could retest that for a higher low over the neckline, the consolidation here sets up the move over 206. So Tesla trying to align more so with the bullish nature of the chart. Last but certainly not least, we have Netflix, some major overhead targets out of Netflix. I mean, these are huge targets. If we go to the daily and back this thing off to a multi-year, I just want to you know remind you that Netflix, the breakdown back here was when volatility was running wild in the marketplace, right? So these structural targets, it's like one day's range 
from in the past. There's really not much going on there over 644.75 into 675.75. If we drop it back down to the hourly chart just to examine sort of the uh, price action on Friday, certainly a strong breakout getting that higher high. So just like everything else, how do we participate in the upside? Higher lows over 605 are ideal. Consolidation around 616 maybe sets up a balance range we could play breakouts from. Uh, and if we are going to flip back to the bear side, you're probably looking for a lower high underneath 597.25. Something that looks like this, yeah, we would concede that would not be ideal, uh, not only on the hourly, but also the daily at that point. So again, your lower high level at 597.25. With that said, a couple of trade ideas, and then you are on your way. Final reminder to hit that subscribe button and join the 100K by May. First up for our trade ideas is Coinbase. C-O-I-N is the ticker here. Notice the multi-day consolidation that's in force after the large breakout on the heels of Bitcoin, of course, breaking out over the weekend session completely sideways into the end of the trading week. We'll see if we can get continuation out of this potential play. The consolidation looks good, but we would have to clear 210.75 with either higher lows or some sort of risk-friendly entry on the initial break here to trade this in the upward direction. The larger target is very large. It's coming from the weekly time frame chart up around 274. Not expecting that we go there in one day, one week, even a month. It could take some time to get there, but the pattern is bullish. You're also getting a little bit of cup and handle vibes from this point of view. Can we break out and continue out of the range to the upside? Not interested if we break down through the lows at 192.25. Next up, we've got Zoom. ZM is the ticker on that one. It's coming back from the dead, basically. And the interesting play here is the inside bar that formed on Friday. Right? If we take a closer look, if we can clear this as a known area of resistance, the next big target is 74. And it's not the greatest range to be trading for. There are stocks that move much better than Zoom. However, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. I do think that the setup is certainly uh, worth adding to a watch list, right? It's in play as long as pullbacks hold over 67.25. I'm not saying that I would enter here and hold through a drawdown into 67.25. I'm saying that as long as the consolidation is here over time, I'm still interested in 71.30 as a potential breakout point. Point. Next up, we have PayPal. PYPL is the ticker on that one. And as we take a closer look, if we need shorts next week, PayPal is looking like the go-to spot. Notice the back-to-back -back inverted hammers. Technically, Friday is an inside bar. If we break back down through the breakout point, notice the equal highs attempted to break out here. It's looking like a failed breakout and a rejection of the daily 250 SMAs. But if we fall underneath the lows of those bars at $60.25, just looking at it as a very classic look above and fail. So almost like what NVIDIA could possibly turn into. Obviously, PayPal is eons weaker than NVIDIA, so please don't draw a one-to-one -one comparison, but the setup uh, is sort of the same idea, if you will, if NVIDIA even wants to present that in the first place. So lower highs below 60.25 target is 57.75. They're not interested on the short, at least, if it never breaks down underneath that Thursday low. Next up, we've got Dollar Tree. DLTR is the ticker on that one. Uh, this is a name that I feel like I thought I would never trade again, but anyways, here we are. Multi-day balance, and the reason I've added this to the watch list is because it has a bullish engulfing bar on Friday. Didn't really get much acceptance over the two equal highs prior. You can see we tested it, but it is a bullish engulfer of Thursday. And if we do get follow through over 149, 153 is the next possible target. It's in play as long as this consolidation holds. You could even get more granular on this one in particular and take a closer look. Oops, let's go down to an hourly time frame chart here. You could take a closer look and say that this probably wants to hold as an intermediate line in the sand, right? You want to see it hold over that Thursday high, which we basically engulfed all of Friday. So that level would be loosely around 147.25. You guys know me, round numbers only up here in the penthouse. So let's do it together. There we go. We're feeling good in the neighborhood. All right. So that's Dollar Tree. Next up, last but not least, we've got Qualcomm, QCOM. It's in the obviously chip making space. And as we take a look at the chart, notice that it's only day one of a breakout of this ascending triangle, right? You could draw in the pretty little support trend line. There's your flat top. We broke out on Friday. Of course, it played nicely with the SMH moving in the upward direction. Can we get day two follow through? The reason I chose Qualcomm instead of something like an honorable mention AM Dizzle, let's take a look at that. It already got day two follow through out of this bull flag consolidation, right? We've already doubled the range in the upward direction and some. We even had a gap up on Friday. So would I want to choose AMD? No, I think you already saw the move out of AMD. Does Qualcomm have the opportunity for continuation? I think more so than a chart that looks like this. And then lastly, 
AVGO, just to be in the space here. Uh, and as we know, they're also reporting earnings into the end of this week. They had a day one breakout here. It's just a question of whether or not, number one, you want to trade something that is this pricey. And number two, if the options market liquidity even will allow you to scalp it intraday, if that's your trading style. So all of these things are sort of on the radar for a semiconductors breakout. But I do think that Qualcomm is possibly the most attractive of the three setups that we just checked in on. Let's check in on Marvel, MRVL on that one. Uh, how are we doing from this point of view? So a gap up sort of more aligned with what's already happened in AMD. I feel like if you were involved for the gap, great. Maybe there's a little bit more continuation, but Qualcomm still strikes me as more uh, qualified as a setup simply because the structure is much closer, right? Let's just go back one more time, QCOM. And you can see that we at least can manage our risk up against this very well-defined level at 158.25. So that's going to do it for today's episode of the weekly watch list. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything new, let me know down below in the comment section or by giving the video a very simple thumbs up. We will be live at 8.15 on Monday for our pre-market prep. Come hang out here on the channel. It is free and open to the public. And with that said, I wish you a green trading week.